Mini episode 597 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by that NBA lottery pick, your pop culture influenced look at the world of hoops. Follow them on the web at that NBA lottery pick.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the FDH Lounge, and this is part 3D of the Kyle Ross History of the Royal Rumble Anthology. Rick Morris and Kyle Ross breaking it down for you. 1999, we are up to this year in uh, professional wrestling with the Royal Rumble. Again, if you want to check out background on how the Rumble came to be, anything like that, any of the vital essentials on the early history of it, Part 1A, 1988, we covered a lot of it there. But we're up to 99, the last one of the previous millennium. And uh, by this point in time, the Attitude Era is well underway. And uh, we grouped these together, 96 to 99, because it was the height of the Monday Night War. This would be the last one uh, where the Monday Night War was even in, in any doubt whatsoever. 99 was the year that the bottom really fell out of WCW. The opening video package here it was very interesting to me, Kyle, because... When you're looking at the modern template for the WWF slash WWE. We've really got to get that on. I keep, like, interchanging them. Yeah, and, you know, all the same thing, essentially. But when you're looking at that, the 99 show, more than a lot of the other ones, maybe more than any of the other ones to date, struck me as there were things they did here that have become subsequently tired tropes, part of the blueprint, and the opening video package... 98 had been the establishment for the first time in the WWF. They had been doing it in WCW since late 96 with Bischoff of the evil boss trope. 99 was the first Royal Rumble that featured that, and it was hugely overlaying everything that happened because you you had the $100,000 bounty on Austin in the Rumble that McMahon had put out. So they were really, really shoving the evil boss thing, the corporation, down your throat. And combined with some of the overbookamania stuff that we saw during the show here, 99, if 98 was the first Attitude Era Royal Rumble, 99 is maybe the first overall modern era Royal Rumble. It's the Royal Russo is what I call it. Yeah. But um, let's take a step back here. You talk about, you know, where we're at with the Monday Night Wars. This will be... The last part of part three, the Monday, uh, although the Monday Night War era does not officially end until 2001, by 99, for all intents and purposes, it was over. Uh, WCW um, just stopped winning. It imploded from within by May of 99. It was just horrible. Um, they had decided to beat Goldberg at Starcade for the first time at 98. That was a stupid decision. I think we can all agree on that. And the WWF, meanwhile, was just rolling. They were coming off yeah. a huge 98, and they're winning the war, clearly, at this point. Right. Clearly. They went from the previous year where they're just, you know, they were making this comeback. They got close. They overtook WCW. By 99, there was no denying that WWF was was winning and... How WCW quick, WCW was not going to make a comeback. How quickly things changed. 98 was the year of transition. The 98 Royal Rumble, the WWF hadn't even interrupted the 83-week winning streak. That would happen right after WrestleMania with the tease of the first Austin-Vince match on TV. Mm-hmm. And by 99, the, the calendar year 99 is when the war was pretty much definitively won. It, everything moved very yeah, quickly. The, 98 was a year of transition. 99 was a yeah. year of solidification. Although 98 was the better year overall, 99 was the year where they set all sorts of TV rating records. Yes. I mean, it was on, The TV ratings were through the roof. The WWE was probably never hotter in the mainstream. I believe 99 was the year that Austin got the cover of Rolling Stone, I believe. I think so, yeah. I think it was early 99. And this rumble comes in the midst of the red-hot Steve Austin, Vince McMahon feud. You kind of alluded to it. Um, they... You, you came into the show knowing they would be number one and two. 
And despite that feud being so hot on TV and one of the most famous feuds in the company history, this show's a misfire. This show, whereas 98, you and I can agree, or disagree, pardon me, to the degree at which we like it. You liked it a lot more than I did, I thought. It was a good show, average rumble. I, I, I find it very difficult to believe that you could... I don't know. There are people, I guess, who like this rumble. I'm in that school of thought that have it clearly one of the worst. I think it's clearly the second worst. Only 95 is worse. Most people hate it. I'm in a tiny minority. When I say three and a quarter stars, I'm in a tiny minority. (laughs) And the look on your face. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. You're going to rip my sliding scale of Royal Rumbles, and you're going to give this. This gets one and a half. Wow. That is probably our biggest difference, I think. So far, isn't it? Uh, it's I've said be. that a few times. This, to me, is it's one of only three rumbles I give below two stars to. This, it's just really bad. Um, you'll recall, if you listen to Part 3C, folks, where I, my issue with the 98 rumble, the match itself, was that it was basically Austin and nothing else. This, you know, Austin had a dance partner in Vince McMahon, but... It really was nothing else besides that. And the way this was done was just not good. It was, everyone knows it by the time, at this point, you know, I I think people who listen to shows like this, it's not like they're like, oh, I wonder what happened at the 1999 Royal Rumble. So they start the match. It's, uh, see, unlike you, who uh, has already got your mind made up when you watch these things going in, no, I always try. That. I always try to give these things a second look. So I went into this show as I just watched it again for the whatever time, and I didn't have a good time. By the way, ninety eight had a great time watching the show. Ninety nine was terrible. I watched it with these terrible people who were like just dumb, and I didn't like them. It's probably influencing you. Well, guess what? I watched it with my friend the Bowl mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> the last time I watched it, which was about a month ago mm-hmm. in preparation for this. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm being the Excel neckbeard guy that Rick <laughs> Norris wants to throw around. And I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. This thing starts off so red hot. The Austin McMahon buildup was great. Yep. The thing with them, one and two, is great. McMahon coming out all jacked. It's funny, and it gets off to the crowd is insane and molten when Austin McMahon, for the first time this is, getting the ring together. Yep. Then they do the angle where they leave the ring. Mm-hmm. And at that point, they all quality is left behind. So are we going to talk about the Rumble match now? Yes. Okay. All yeah, right. I don't think there's really – yeah, I, okay. I, I think, yeah, with this one it's a little different. Okay. Okay. Um, there's not the undercards of World Blink and You'll Miss It in a Fair and Rock Foley rather than talk about it in the landscape of storyline. I think we need to talk about it in a different sense. Okay. Um, I love how our, our on-air production meetings, by the way. <laughs> I, Spontaneity. Yeah. I, I just think that it is impo- – like, three stars to me is a good match. You cannot have a good – like, you cannot – like, 85% of this is horrible. Like if it wasn't for if it wasn't for define the Austin horrible. McMahon dynamic, define horrible. Okay, Golga, Darren Drozdov, Gilberg, Steve Blackman, Dan Severn, Tiger Ali Singh, Blue Meanie, Mabel. Uh, oh, by the way, that is nine straight guys that come in. Outside of Tiger Ali Singh and, and and Mabel, I don't really have a problem with that most of the rest of the names there. Golga. You, know, you, you defended Kurgan, well, so it look, wouldn't surprise me you're going to defend Golga. It, that is in the he was a comedy character, but he was a comedy character that was going after Austin uh, to get the one hundred thousand dollars. Funny, it, but it Austin worked. wasn't there, so guess what? He was no, just no, an no, idiot no, with a mask on. No, 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 because he was there when I, I think Austin eliminated him when it was uh, him and uh, yes, Vince you're, still okay. In the I ring. take that back. Yes, his fifteen seconds. Yeah, so like I thought it worked as far as telling a story that even this comedy character wanted the one hundred thousand dollars so much. By the way, too, the thing of having him come out in a South Park T-shirt. Another one of the things here too. This is the, the outlaws year, had done that the previous year. Yeah, and this is the year, and I think it's not a coincidence on what I'm going to say. This is the year that the WWF went public. You don't see that today. You don't see guys getting the leeway to wear a Cartman shirt or whatever because, like, OMG, need to be wearing our own shirt to push merch. Golga made himself a little bit different by wearing the Cartman shirt. That Golga was a nice little touch. Stunk. 
not a good gimmick. Uh, John Tenta, God rest his soul, was a much better worker than the gimmick, but it didn't really work so well. No, it didn't. Uh, they, they should. Gilbert was bush league. Blackman never Gilbert, got over. Here, here's Severn a, never got over. This is one of the things that I want to talk about. Is that uh, this was during that uh, bout of balls pels, uh, bells palsy that they, uh, Jr. had. Yeah, so Jr. He, does not commentate. He was not here. on the show. It was it was Michael Cole, who's as we, miserable as ever. Yes. Here's the thing, too, and this really struck me watching Michael Cole call the Gilberg entrance here. Gilberg was a forerunner of the WWE PG era, and I'm using quote marks, air quotes, humor. It's the kind of crap you get today. Michael Cole and JBL with the fake canned laughter at a gimmick. Well, I'll Gilbert tell you what. was a forerunner of that. Yeah, I'll tell you what. You can call it attitude. You can call it PG. Gilbert ain't funny in any era. No, he's not. I mean, it was moderately amusing, I guess, the first time, but the fact that they kept doing it was dumb. Kept doing it. Listen, Edge and Draws in there. I Edge, thought they had Edge a was good sequence. I, I thought they did. Edge, neither guy meant a thing. Uh, I mean, Edge wasn't super over, but I don't he, think he was even over. He wasn't. He he, he was not getting. Uh, uh, tumbleweeds. Edge was getting some response there was, here. There was apparently a brood job squad feud that has gone long forgotten that I missed here somewhere. Well, and it was interesting, too, seeing uh, Gangrel in the match. I had kind of forgotten it, and, and we'll talk about this with the... Uh, we're not going to talk much about the undercard, but but in watching that, uh, that good X-Pac Gangrel match, I'd kind of forgotten that Gangrel was pretty good. In, in my mind, I tended to think he was so far behind Edge and Christian and he was in terms of career, but boy, he he had a good gimmick. I don't think that was a he had a good match. He had a decent move set. I mean, he was yeah better than I remembered. Gangrel better than I remembered. That's I, cool. I don't know how high that bar is. I shudder to think about you remembering. I just thought that Austin McMahon leaving the ring and then it like not even being explained to live. The live crowd was basically just waiting the whole time for Austin McMahon to come back. And That's not a good rumble. Here's the thing. I'm going to defend this the same way you defended at WrestleMania 31. Uh, Seth Rollins uh, getting the uh, championship victory in the end, cash in of money in the bank, whatever. I will grant you something like that, if used once in a certain circumstance, can work. This one here, I do not generally advocate making a mockery of the Rumble rules. Two guys disappear for a long stretch, albeit on rewatch here recently. Austin was back in earlier than I thought. I thought, in my mind, Austin was out until the very end. Austin entered somewhere midway, later-ish, kind of. So it wasn't as bad as that. And then, of course, Vince didn't come back in until the end. I can see doing that once. And, and honestly, we remember 1999 for this. Well, I mean, we... Name me a defining feature of any other rumble in the 90s. You know, and it's like, well, what's the year that, you know, Austin well, and Vince... Yeah, somebody will immediately say 1999. It's memorable. Well, I mean, just because it's... Well, thank you, Al Snow. The Red Rooster was so good because it was memorable. Uh, that's a bullshit... <laughs> that's a bullshit excuse. Coincidentally, didn't Al Snow have a nice run in this uh, match here with the uh, Job Squad? Uh, he was on the Job Squad. I'll, I'll say that. He was just one, another, one of many jobbers. You know, Al, uh, you know, just like... You I know. had one of those T-shirts back in the day. Pin me, pay me. Yeah, you would. You know, <laughs> Al, again, just another guy. You know, Al, you know, another, welcome to the big leagues, Al. Uh, you know, it's it's a little harder to get over here. Yeah, well, he, he, it was it was a great gimmick in ECW. I wish and it had been used a little bit better there. No, it, it a little better. Uh, it was just an excuse for people to chant the word head. It was pretty clever with the fake heads and people waving them at the live shows. Paul Heyman's right. It made you want to be there. It made you want to be in the crowd. Wow. That's... It was... Yeah. That's bad. Yeah, call me an ECW Kool-Aid drinker. You are. That was... You are. Trust me, it's become readily apparent. <laughs> it's a Pavlonian dog thing. The guy was never over. He had what? a chant that was over. By the way... Uh... I, I want to say this with yeah. the, the whole thing about, oh, we remember this... The reason that they, a lot of, a major reason I think they were forced to do this. Mm -hmm. And look, they did have a storyline, and I guess it was unique. But the reason they had to do the bullshit with McMahon winning here, mm -hmm. I think they had to come up with something creative mm -hmm. because Austin couldn't win a third year in a row. And we talked about when we started this part three, the, the February pay-per-view. Yeah. They knew in the back of their minds they could do a screw job finish here with yep. McMahon and they could set it right at the February pay-per-view. They knew that, 
And I'm not saying it's wrong, but again, back to my original point, I prefer that. And and look, Austin winning a third time, would that have been, I guess, boring? Maybe a little bit, but it doesn't make it good. At least what they, they acknowledged did. he was a two-time champion, unlike the previous year. But here's the thing, though, Kyle. I'm going to throw this back at you because you like to do this with me with 97 WCW, which got formulaic and tiresome as the year went along. You keep saying to me, it worked, it worked. 99 WWF was pretty hot, buddy. Like it or not. It worked. Like I'm it or not, say, well, I'm, it doesn't mean made, every show did. It would, I'm not saying that every sh- show it, worked. It made money. I think the, it was a successful era. Now, I'm not saying that's the end-all, be-all, but I'm throwing your logic back at you when you defend 97 WCW to I me. I don't always which defend gets, it. You, and, and, and that gets pretty indefensible as the year goes along. It gets pretty indefensible. No, all I said was like, that Starcade like, was the biggest money show that company ever did. It was a terrible it, it, show, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it was. Yeah, but but it, I'm just saying, like, just because 99 was a great year doesn't mean the yeah. Rumble has to be great. But, like, you, you, you kind of seem a little bit chapped that, like, the people at the time didn't share your indignation and stopped spending money on the product. Because they didn't. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that I had a problem with the product. I'm saying I have a problem with the show. But you, you the, don't like 99 as a whole, especially early 99, I guess, and the WrestleMania period, whatever. You don't like that period as a the whole. The show's not good. You don't like, yeah, but you don't, you know. I don't have a problem with the general product. I just think the show, you don't really when, like when the, you take things into consideration, yeah, but you compared to other WrestleManias. Yeah, but you've said to me, though, like, yeah, you, that you don't like WrestleMania of that year. You're no, not, you're it's not. You're not big on the depth on St. Patrick's, or uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's not a terrible show, but it's not a okay. great show. Okay. I mean, compared to 2000, I mean, this 99 states. And again, you know, the public was still lapping it up. And I guess, again, I'm still sort I'll of... I'll remember that when you rip John Cena th- I'm st- into the future. It don't even tell me the public is behind him. That's why he They gets, are! Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's why he can't go into a, a building where there's any kind of crowd reaction and, and not get any booze. Yeah, he, don't, he, don't, sells, he, he sells all the merchandise. And unstudies loser, you're loser, IWC, Excel, Neckbeard fans who think they're the reason that people go to see wrestling shows. Maybe you didn't shows. see the article on Cage Side Seats I don't read those dumb si- that, websites. Uh, <laughs> That noted that uh, there wasn't really any apparel for anybody else on the European tour except for John Cena. So that would kind of explain why people weren't able to buy other people's merch. It's a stacked deck, buddy. I hate to tell you. Good Lord. The liberal excuses from you are unbelievable. I wouldn't say that. I, I think wow. what I'm saying could A bunch of tools that show up chanting Cena sucks. Wow. My, my John Cena theories, uh, you, you're calling them liberal or whatever. That could come right off an Alex Jones podcast, I would well, say. I, so you're, you got the side of the aisle wrong. Look, back to 99. Back to 99. This is a terrible know, rumble. The, the, look, it's the humans, easily the second worst rumble ever. I, I'm not going to defend the human sacrifice angle they did with Mabel. That Dude, was the there's birth three of points in this match where there's no one in the match. Yeah. Kane, that is un- that's Kane, inexcusable. Cleared house, and then they did the white Normally, I'd be angle. like, what were they thinking? But I know, unfortunately, the problem was Vince Russo was thinking. By the way, too. And that does of, negatively influence me in retrospect, the fact yeah. that Russo's fingerprints are all over this. But you know what? Yeah. Vince Russo's a shitty booker when left I, to his I own will, devices. I and you can this. clearly tell, unlike 98, yeah. where Russo was filtered through. And, okay, there were some elements of Russo. Yeah. This was a Russo production through and through. Kyle, I'll give you this. There are some th- and, and while, again, I tend to be more as I was in the moment in the Attitude Era when I'm viewing these, and you tend not to be, but here's, here's what I'll give you. No I one will, was treated will, as important in I this thing. I will admit, I will admit to you, some things can't be seen at the time. Some things can only be seen in hindsight, and I'll give you a perfect example. When Vince Russo jumped to WCW in the fall of 99, all any of us saw was the track record of success. In retrospect, looking back, we see that. How much success did he have? That's like, what's what was the question? I mean, did Vin, was it because because the company? But like, what was his peak? Survivor Series '98? Did he ever do anything good creatively after? I mean, the 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 finish of the Austin Rock feud. Okay, you know what? Rock Foley and Austin Rock. But, like, outside of the 90, main event picture, he never really did much good. Yes, and he just had really good people to work with. But we and I don't think that he we solely that booked that. Retrospect. Right. No. We, did, we didn't see we didn't I see just that. think that everyone here, like, I want to hear something that's shocking. I want to defend China. Okay, here's something you're not going to get on she most really shows. over, yeah. Yeah, and she was booked over as this big deal that had won number 30, first woman in. She gets 35 seconds. Throughout China, or throughout Henry single-handedly, though. 
She threw out Mark Henry 35 by herself. Thirty-five second entrance. Well, and then uh, Austin clotheslines her from behind. Yeah, which isn't a good way to keep her. I mean, although I guess she tur- winds up turning heel. Short. Well, here's another thing too. Do you know that six people are responsible for all the eliminations in this match? This is just such. That's a- amazing. Well, the Road Dog was alone for a few stretches he, during the he match. He was the MVP at one point. And I'll tell you what, again, a guy that whether you like it or not, Kyle Ross. I don't have a problem with the over, road dog. Super over. Uh, you seem a little disdainful of like maybe like no. he doesn't check off all the boxes on the spreadsheet, maybe like you know, some of your nineteen ninety four favorites, but uh I never said that. You know, I, I don't know. I am I'm just speculating, but uh I will say this too. It, it's an odd kind of a thing. The first half of the match it was loaded with guys who would not be long for this company. Most of the no. names you read and off before. Yes. It's really they weird. They all stink, except Edge. A lot of them had a purpose to play, though, for yeah, however long yeah, they were there. Yeah, not call, Tiger Ali Singh. Yeah, but, g- yeah, being in there for a minute to be thrown out because you need 30 people in this I match. mean in the company at the time. I mean, Steve Blackman was a part of some storylines at the time. None here. of them I good. He would subsequently be a part of Head Cheese. Which was an atrocity. <laughs> so, well, you know. Hey, at uh, least they found someone less over than him. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, again, to, to me... Draws? The blue... Uh, if you defend the blue meanie, then you just need to go blue back to... The blue meanie was entertaining. I mean, I'm, I'm an ECW guy, so what do you... you know? Uh, yeah, he was well, entertaining. You know. He was totally... I'm sorry. Like, it's... Look, the welcome to the big leagues thing is inappropriate many times. Yeah. It applies to the blue meanie. I don't think it applied to the Blue Meanie. I don't think it applied to Al Snow. You're talking about guys that were really over in the ECW, they which were, was a pretty good focus group, were, I'd say, for the public at large. If it could get over there, why couldn't it get over in the WWF properly translated? Why didn't he, if ECW is such a great focus group, why did it go out of business? It had a lot of things working against it. Paul uh, well, Heyman, liberal excuses. Well, Paul Heyman wasn't good with the books. You yeah, know. even though WWF so, was giving him his money. You, you talk about foreshadowing and stuff here. Um, future uh, White House press secretary Robert Gibbs. There was a there was a Robert Gibbs sign in the crowd. There was also a McMahon is juiced sign in the crowd, and Jerry <laughs> Lawler acknowledged it. Uh, yeah, it was a different time, but uh, and Vince really looked uh, juiced. He yes. comes back out at the end in a black sweatshirt for whatever reason. After they did the whole angle, Austin well, gets beat the, up. The oil must have come off him or something. <laughs> I'll say this: mm-hmm. the pop. Here's the thing. This is the problem. So remember 95? I killed 95 because really the only good part was the very end. Right. This gets a, better than 95. I mean, yeah. say, I'm comparing this to 1995. Yeah. Okay, yes, the year as a whole, business was much better. But as a Royal Rumble match, just evaluating it as a Royal Rumble match, this had a good first two minutes and a good last two minutes, and that's it. But the I, other I was, 55 minutes were manure. I was entertained throughout. That's just I was me. not. I was, it, by, by the way, too, uh, when China was in there with Mark Henry, uh, Jerry Lawler brings up the transvestite yes, storyline. Yes. Vince says, quote, that was a mistake, end quote. And my, my note was, you've got to love shoot comments that aren't supposed to be shoot comments. Look, the, the whole thing with Vince coming back to commentary and him rooting for someone to throw Austin, and then it comes yeah. down to Austin. That was great. Heel Vince on commentary was a nice touch. When you remember in your head liked, what he was doing the previous years. I also liked that he wasn't acting like real tough, like he would win. Right. Like he did in subsequent Later, years. Later, yeah. He's, um, like, he's like, uh, Ken Shamrock, oh, I don't think I need to get in there with him. Uh, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. He, he, he was much better. Uh, I just think that McMahon winning is kind of lame. And that the rumble itself just was to not good it because it's set up St. Valentine's Day. I, I don't, you know. We're, we're you talking could, about setting up a fe- February pay-per-view? You. But Austin and McMahon in a cage, that's an iconic moment of the Attitude Era. I think it's actually a little overrated. Super Brawl mind beat it in the, in the buy rate. Well, again, you know. And it, you could have done that cage match without doing this. You could have been a, a desperate McMahon, could have gone to any length to challenge Steve Austin to take his spot away. I don't think you needed to have Vince McMahon go over here to, to make that match. Well, that ma- people wanted that match anyway. Yeah, that, that uh, you you could have booked it another way, but again, we're dealing with hypotheticals here. That's it, to me, it worked. Oh, I can't wait till we start dealing with hypotheticals it worked. later. It worked. I, and uh, that's that's all I uh, look at. Uh, so that's a lot of the stuff, you know, with the match itself. Rock ends up helping out uh, McMahon to uh, to win the match, thus helping to you know preview the WrestleMania feud. Uh, it, it wasn't referred to on commentary, but also avenging. The Rock being last thrown out by Austin the year no, before. I don't think that was really part of the storyline. This, this Austin Rock storyline, and it's funny because they had, you know, they had that brief feud in, in um, 
December of 97, right. actually. Um, and then, you know, kind of carrying to that Royal Rumble. But um, this Austin Rock feud incarnation began at the Survivor Series. And, um, you know, they wrestled the next night on Raw, which did a monster number. Yep. Um, and they, you know, Undertaker or Austin got screwed by the Undertaker in that match. Hit in the head with a uh, shovel. shovel. And then um, Rock transition to Foley, who we worked with here. Right. Before we get to that, though, oh. I, I, I want to I just touch on some things briefly on the undercard. I thought the end was so that. lame. It was, uh, yeah. I, I, I thought so as well. Uh, oh, not, you do. not much to say about a lot of the uh, undercard stuff. Like I said, um, X-Pac Gangrel, you're going to disagree with me. I thought it was a really good match. It was for the European title. I, I thought it was a really good match. It was better than I uh, expected. I'm going to talk about these ones together because I find it to be emblematic of this. One of the criticisms I have of this era and, and of the Russoism, you had already introduced the European title. Now there's the hardcore title. We're getting to title bloat. You have a match where Road Dog, who's the hardcore champ, wrestles Big Boss Man, who's the tag team champ, and then the next match uh, you've got uh, Shamrock, who is the Intercontinental Champ and Tag Team Champ against uh, Badass. So a lot of them in there. Road Dog loses clean to a sidewalk slam. Um, I'm thinking, well, how does he not lose the title 24-7 rule? And then I looked it up. That happened a year later. This also, was the, the title days. just wasn't even on the line. Yeah, non-title match. Stupid. How does the boss man go over the Road Dog? I, I don't understand that. Shamrock going over Badass makes sense, except for the fact that Badass was going to get a push later in the year. I will. And he was supposed to win this originally, but the, he started blabbing finishes. I think, and I Is think that what he, it was? I think he showed he was there was something he was like drunk or something. Okay, and they and they decided he was supposed to go over originally. Thank God he didn't because Billy Gunn solo wrestler terrible. Well, here's the thing as well here, and I never knew what the storyline explanation was, and it wasn't really referred to here. When you have a couple of randos like Bossman and Shamrock, yeah, they're both in the corporation. By the way, something we I forgot. They were the tag champs at this point. That's what I'm saying. A couple of randos are thrown together to be the tag champs. You have the outlaws who are pursuing individual titles, and they're never mentioned as a viable tag team title contender. Well, they have just lost the titles to them. I, I, I understand that, but there was no talk of them getting them back. They were only being referred to. Because that wasn't to, the plan. They were, but no, no, no. But they were only being referred to with singles focus. But there seemed to be no storyline for why these guys wouldn't want their tag team titles back. Well, I think the issue was that uh, they weren't going to. They they, they weren't pushed. They, the, the next night on Raw, I believe yeah. they put them on Owen and Double J. Yeah, they were. Uh, here's the thing, too, uh, and I forgot to mention this from the Rumble when we we're talking about the corporation. If, if anybody wants to know about the staleness of the WWF over the years slash WWE and repetition of things, I didn't realize this until I was watching this. Kane has spanned the corporation to the authority. Think about that mm-hmm. for a hot minute. Yeah, he's been around for a while. Hasn't but, I, he? but, I mean, dude, he was in the same gimmick briefly in 99. The same friggin' corporate gimmick. I, 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 didn't, I had forgotten that. Um I had a note here, too. Shamrock and X-Pac both with their kicks. That would have made an interesting match at some point. I think we missed out by not having a Shamrock and X-Pac I think feud. they did the Intercontinental title final in fall 98. Maybe. Okay, i got to look that up. Also, I'm, bu- I'm, busy, I'm busy laughing at St. Valentine's Day Massacre and its parade of one-star matches. <laughs> Sable and Luna in the, in the title match. Uh, Shane, that seemed like a forced thing. He was out there trying to give the rub to Luna and trying to give the anti-corporation rub to Sable. Sable didn't need to be against the corporation. Sable had peaked. Uh, she had cleared. No, well, she'd peaked already at this point. Really? She was actually. Oh, yeah. Her, was she on the way down already by this point? Because she oh. was so hot uh, for all of 98. And this was just a month into 99. Yeah, she'd cool up. She, remember, they turned her like heel with that Tory thing by WrestleMania. Yeah, because Tory was the stalker who came in and attacked Luna to win the match here. And. Yeah, okay. Sable had cooled significantly. I thought. Okay. Like, she, you know what? She was still kind of over here, but like. She had her, she'd hit her peak already. Okay. Well, this was a lot of the. I, I think I covered all the undercard yep. stuff here up to all right. Mankind and Rock, which uh, is a match that has a legacy, obviously because of Beyond the Mat. Um, way too many chair shots. It's. I'll be honest it's with you. It's hard to watch. It's really. It's not cool to watch. I understand no. why they did it. Fully cared a lot. You talk about guys protecting himself. Right. Full. It was they did an I quit match. So yeah. let's back up. In one of the great all-time moments of my, you talk about great, you don't know want me an Excel, an Excel spreadsheet and hating on this era. Let me let's see. Right. I call him. I call him as I see him. 
Okay. Is what I do. Uh, and in one of the great moments on Monday Night Raw history, Mick Foley wins the title from The Rock. That was amazing. I remember um, that. And so this is the rematch, and they do it. I quit rule. The thinking being like, well, Mick Foley will never quit. Mm-hmm. And so they had to find a way for him to quit. And again, goofy finish, taped, you know, voice him saying I quit. But and the announcers didn't pick up on it. No, it should have been so obvious. Yeah, which should have been like, wait, was that him? Yeah. But the thing is. It's to get there, and look, everyone's seen this if they've watched Beyond the Mat with his kids there, and you, that wasn't made. Did they let you know that that his kids were there? No, they in the, didn't. In the, in the no. commentary? Okay. It's just brutal, man. Like, people can talk about PG and, and look down on it for all the stuff they do. Chair shots to the head are bad, man. Oh, I, I don't want uh, I mean, to go I back can to tell, that. I mean, I can tell you for a fact, those in the company will tell you, Mick Foley, today, when he shows up, he forgets what freaking city he's in. Yeah. And, 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 and that's look. like like he probably wouldn't take it back the stuff he did at King of the Ring and this because look it made him a very wealthy man, but I just don't think it was necessary to go to that level. Well, and, and at all, I mean, it it, it, it got the Rock over as a heel, it which did. they were struggling to do because he was starting to get over as a face. Yeah, but. because they were there in, in three months. They were going to turn him anyways. Once they got the backlash rematch with Austin, he was going to go face, and it was it, they were struggling to keep him heel. I will tell you this, and this is another thing here too. And I teased this to you, and I think off air. I I was struck in watching this match, and you go to again, and and again, was there a little bit of repetitiveness with this match and the main event? Yes, in terms of the corporate plan, if you will. Austin was baited into the women's restroom trap by McMahon where the corporation was waiting. Rock climbed up the ladder to get to the stands, baited Foley to get up there. What triggered the whole thing of the Rock going on offense was shoving Foley off down onto the worked electrical yeah. system here. Lights in the building went off. That was kind of goofy. Michael but I, Cole was trying so hard to be Jim Ross in this match, and it was not working at all. But here, here's the thing, too. First of all, the match would have been better with JR because even though JR could overdo the, the emotion, Michael Cole's on the other extreme. He's a friggin' robot. Michael Cole's a paint by numbers guy who's like, I need to make people believe this is a moment of great gravity. You know, he, he's a robot. JR, I'd rather take the excessive emotion with that being the case. But here's the thing what The Rock did in this match, this is a th- thing. And, and, and what the over-the-top punishment that was inflicted upon Foley. To me, the trope was created. The entire Triple H main event style from 02 to 06. Triple H should be sending him royalty checks every month because in looking at this, he ripped off the rock in this match at every step of the way because that was in, in the in the evolution era and even thereafter the whole thing of my god this is the cruelest man in the history of the universe the rock in this match was the most evil dick you've ever seen yes. and triple h just mimic that like in watching this after remembering all the triple h post attitude era stuff like oh my god triple h just ripped off this match and it just I give The Rock credit, but again, it was so over the top. It was, you know. It's just not cool in retrospect. You just no. don't want to watch it. Well, and the other thing, too, like, look, and, and I'm so, don't, don't want me in because I'm a guy that hates the PG era. I don't want chair shots to the head. I want there to be the capacity for a little bit of color. C- can we agree on that? Blood, occasional blood is good. Can we agree on that? Occasional. Occasional. I'm not saying every week because then that devalues they over, it. They overdid it. And, and the, look, the bottom line is, man, you talk to people in the company, sponsors hate it. They think right. it is the worst thing ever. Right, right. I don't I don't like how the the, the no-selling of extreme stuff in that era. The, this, this was, again. And, and yeah, they, I remember, do you know what was the other... Other than this, there is one um, Mick Foley match that G- that rivals this in terms of a comfortable watch. You talk about blood and chair shots. Mm-hmm. The thing with him and Flair at that SummerSlam. That's right, 06. It is this, I watched that again. Mm-hmm. That is so sad to watch. It is like two old guys. Yep. Just like, it's just, it's, I hate this. It's just sad. Well, Flair like was- doing all this stuff, and it's like, what are you guys doing? Flair, in, in, in his last years... Flair was doing the bleed like a stuck pig at the drop of a hat thing every time he turned yeah. around. By the way, too, there was a nice what I call Ty Cobb moment in the match when uh, Foley was handcuffed uh, toward the end. He had his arms behind his back. Michael Cole yells out, 
uh, as uh, Rock's about to give him a chair shot, he yells out, he's got no arms! And it reminded me of that great line with Ty Cobb when he attacked the handicapped guy in the stands. Yeah. Somebody yelled out, he's got no arms, Ty Cobb. American baseball legend memorably yelled back, I don't care if he's got no feet. Yeah, I thought it was legs. but <laughs> yeah, legs. Yeah, Maybe yeah. it was legs. Yeah. So I, um, what was I going to say? Um, but the match, I don't know. It is a, like, if you have to give a star rating, it's like three and a quarter-ish or well, something like that. You, but it's just like, it's not. Just because it gets a good star rating doesn't mean that I like really like you it. You may think it's over the top for me to say this, but I'm going to say this. that it, it, I think it's as hard to rate this because of and, – and let me back up for a second. I'm a guy that has a hard time watching Muhammad Ali matches. So you got to watch the Rumble in the Jungle. Great, great. Let me watch the groundwork for this guy to get Parkinson's in later years. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. It's as hard for me to objectively rate this match as it is a Chris Benoit match. It's funny you mentioned that. I thought that. Too. Like, really? The, like, okay. Like, it's funny that because it's just – it sort of transcends wrestling in a real – like, yes. wrestling's escapism. Yes, No matter yes. what they say about reality era, it, mirroring exactly. reality. Yeah. Wrestling is escapism. You don't want to be like, oh, this is why McFoley like – can't walk that well and Chris Benoit right. you watch it now it's like oh boy yeah it's like this guy's really good at his job but you, you know remember that part where he murders his whole family right you're right it's just not it's not like it doesn't matter like it's like okay there's a storyline here but it's like dude like you can't stop thinking about the realities of the situation the realities right. aren't fun right in this so yeah I mean, it's not like you know I mean it, it's a lot more serious than like the shitty booking of Vince Russo in right. the Royal Rumble here right and, uh, again, an and interesting show. And, and what's weird as we're talking about all this, and, and, again, I think it's related. You talk about Russo. As we look ahead to the next chapter here, I think it's, it's a combination of things in 2000 and going forward. 99 sort of marks the end of the first part of the boom. Later in the year, going into the early part of the next year, you get this incredible influx of talent. You get Russo and Ferraro leaving for WCW, a chance for a clean start with the booking. By 2000, at at the Royal Rumble, then things are pretty cool again, and and, and we've got the upturn for the rest of the boom creatively, and they're going to do great business in 2000. Uh, But it's a thing where, as as you look at it, you know, the, the things that we don't like about the 99 product, and again, there's things that I don't like uh, as well, even if I'm less bothered than you. But essentially... I'm just talking about... I thought we were talking about Royal Rumbles, not years. No, no, no. But I mean, you know, uh, both the Royal Rumble and the year, I'm higher on them than you are. But it's a thing where the things that we're complaining about with the 99 Royal Rumble, and that even I have complained about, they kind of tend to take care of themselves. This is a reactive company, so as long as things are going good, Vince wasn't going to rock the boat. Vince wasn't going to purge all the guys in the Royal Rumble just because you said they sucked and whatever, but everything kind of took well, care of itself, matter. Kyle. It didn't matter. He had the hottest... Right. It was a, he had the hottest uh, draw of all time. It was a turnover that kind of naturally occurred. And by would you agree with me, by the time we get to 2000, a lot of these things had sort of self-corrected? Yeah, I mean, it just, uh, it, you know, I mean, it just... You know, I always think you should flush the mid-card every couple of years, and they flushed it, and they, and they wound up with a lot better talent in the mid-card. They did. but I but mean, TV ratings might have gone down a little bit in 2000, but overall the company was more profitable. They, they were more uh, profitable. And, uh, yeah, and I think it made for just better overall shows. Best, most profitable year they ever had. But uh, 99, again, uh, a pretty uh, profitable year. Uh, nevertheless, and, and even despite any of the uh, you know problems that people would have had like you with the uh, with the Royal Rumble, a, a profitable year nonetheless. Uh, oh, I'm yeah. not saying it was a bad year. I'm just saying this was not a good show. It, uh, and just uh, like like good years can have bad shows. Sure, just like bad years can have good shows. Well, you don't seem to like a lot of the shows in '99 though, which is which is interesting. Individually, they're not. Um, I think that this. Mm-hmm. WrestleMania, okay, and King of the Ring are three pretty big dogs. Okay, um, Saint Valentine's Day is okay. Okay, uh, Backlash is a pretty okay show if I remember. Over the Edge, you know, the less said the better. Um, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Uh, fully loaded ninety nine. 
I don't remember a lot about it. Wasn't that like when McMahon left, like they did an Austin Undertaker match? Right. Like, yeah. I can't remember a lot about that. Right. SummerSlam was okay. Yeah. Um, I was at No Mercy. That was fine. Unforgiven was had a good, the main event was okay. The fall was weird just because of how quickly they turned Vince and Shane. That, that seemed really, mm-hmm. really weird. Yeah. I, that I just came think, out of nowhere. I'm not, I mean, I just think it, a lot of it doesn't hold up necessarily, yeah. 99. Yeah. It worked at the time, but it didn't, It you know, when you have to, you know, do shows about this and you watch it in retrospect, you're like, ooh, this isn't that good. Yeah. Well, I, I had less of a feeling about that than you did of, of the uh, the Royal Rumble. Uh, me thinks we'll probably both agree on uh, 2000. Two th- it's, uh, uh, well, 2000, in my opinion, is one of the best pay-per-views they ever did. Okay. At the time when it happened, you go back okay. to at the time, uh, it was hailed as probably the best pay-per-view the company had done in the Attitude Era. Okay. Well, we'll have that so, to look and, and forward to. Yeah, the whole part four that's going right. to be now is going to be 2000 to 2002. Okay. Pretty short there, just three years. All right. And I am calling it From a War to the Game, as we will be talking extensively about Triple H. Okay. Gonna and be, the specter uh, he looms during all that right. period. All about the game and the various ways that he played it. Next up, when the Royal Rumble Anthology with Kyle Ross continues. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IAmBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 